Hello there guys, it's LazyBeast here today with a guide on what you can focus on during the pre-patch for The War Within. So the first week is essentially just a massive systems update with the talent reworks and changes coming in too. Then the second week will start the event and that will last us up until the end of the pre-patch until the expansion goes live. So we've got basically about a month with the pre-patch. So the first thing I would say that's relevant for everybody is get your build set up. Now you might want a different build for world content, a different build for Mythic Plus, a more single target oriented build for raiding perhaps and obviously builds for healers and for tanks. So there have been some big class reworks and some substantial changes for the talents and things going into the war within so definitely familiarize yourself with those if you haven't been keeping up to date with your class. The easiest way to do this would be to check out Wowhead because I believe they are going to publish some pre-patch guides for every class and spec so if you're really out of the loop that's probably your best place to start. Otherwise, I would recommend checking out your favorite content creator for your spec and class, or the class discords as well. They're often quite a good source, depending on which class you are. Now, do be mindful that some of the builds in the pre-patch might be a little bit weird, because of course we don't have access to the hero talents yet. Now, when they do come into the mix, when you reach max level in the War Within, you might find that little elements of your build will change to get the best out of the build. So. Do bear that in mind. We do sometimes get a pretty weird scenario in the pre-patch when certain things are active and certain things aren't. For example, we're not quite sure yet if the tier sets from Season 4 of Dragonflight will be active. If they are, there's going to be some pretty mad things going on with certain builds. So don't worry perhaps if you see, for example, another class doing absolutely insane damage, pulling off crazy things, and you're not quite yet. It's simply because the builds aren't quite fully fleshed out, and obviously things aren't really balanced around a pre-patch, so fear not. Everything will all smooth out, fingers crossed, at the end game in the War Within. So sort out your builds, be familiar with what you're going to be doing in the War Within when it comes to talents and things. And also the next thing will be to set up your UI. So do make sure all your add-ons are up to date. Um, you might want to get things like new weak auras, depending on the class changes. You might have different things to track now, such as you know buffs and things to keep track of that are part of your rotation. Maybe dots on enemies that you need to be aware of and track when they stack to a certain amount, for example. So do be mindful of that. You might want a new set of weak auras and things. Um, and also just making sure your UI is something that you're happy with. Now, I have had a couple of questions about my UI specifically. So what I will be doing is doing a video about my UI uh, sometime before the expansion launches. And I will give you my LVY profile import string so you can copy that if you want to. And I'll also recommend some other key add-ons that you're probably going to want to get for yourself in the war within if you don't have them already. So stay tuned for that. Do subscribe to be notified when that video goes live. Okay, so another thing to be having to think about right now is the professions. So be mindful, you know, what professions do you want to take in the war within? Do you want to change? Do you want to stay with what you've currently got? I would have a think about do you want to be a crafter or a gatherer or do you not want to bother with professions at all? And that would be fine as well because of course the crafting system, the work orders thing is still staying in the war within with some slight improvements. And also the crafting system itself with the crafting knowledge and all those kind of things, that is staying in the war within too. So professions, if you are going to do them, they are pretty in depth still. So it's going to be something you're going to spend a fair bit of time doing. So it's definitely something to take seriously. Personally, I've gone with mining and engineering. I'm going to keep it simple. I don't have an alt army. I don't have time for that kind of thing to be putting tons of time into professions. And I just enjoy engineering for the little quirks and perks that you get from that uh, profession. And I will just use the work order system if I need to get any crafted gear done. So that's my choice. You might want to do something totally different. But just have a think about what you want to do so you're not caught off guard, maybe a couple of weeks behind if you do decide to start professions after the expansion has gone live. One thing to know is it doesn't matter too much anymore about purring professions. For example, you don't need to have a, um, you know, a mine and a blacksmith together. You don't need to have a tailor and an enchanter together anymore as much because you've of course got the warband bank to make use of when it comes to swapping materials between characters. So it's much easier these days. Don't worry about having a perfect purring professions. The only ones I would recommend sticking to together are the gathering ones, so mining and herbalism. It's probably a good idea to still keep your character as a gatherer and have those professions linked together. Just It just makes sense, it's a bit more efficient that way. Now you do of course have the event, the Raiding Echoes, to look forward to in the second week onwards of the pre-patch, but what else can you do? Because of course the class changes and thinking about professions isn't going to fill your time. Well, if you are actively playing the game up until the expansion launches, one thing you could do is make use of the new transmog rules and go and do some transmog runs because you can now, of course, get pretty much any type of armor and gear on any character that you do transmog runs on. So if you're running as a, a priest, for example, 
if you get some plate dropping from a raid that you're farming, you're going to be able to learn the appearance of that plate gear. Now, there are some exceptions, uh, some very specific ones. If you're doing some of the really old school raids that have, for example, the you know the the judgment set from uh, which one, which raid is it? Black Wingler, the old school Black Wingler. Um, if those judgment shoulders drop and you're playing on a rogue, you will not be able to learn those because they are paladin specific. Now, I do feel like this is a bit of an oversight because you can absolutely learn tier pieces from other classes um, in the later raids. So I think it's just to do with how the items themselves are configured. I did submit a ticket about this on the beta because it seems a bit weird that you can't do that. Um, but yeah, for the vast majority of gear, you can loot that and learn that on any spec. So it's pretty nice, to be honest. If you do loot a tier token piece from a raid that you cannot actually use on the current class you're on, don't worry because it will bind to your warband so you can either mail that to one of your characters or put it in your warband bank and go onto the specific character that can use that piece and let them loot that from the bank and then learn the appearance. It does work with weapons too, for example I was running Blackwing Lur on my druid and a crossbow dropped and I was able to learn the appearance of that crossbow without being able to actually wield the crossbow. And quite the nice thing about random greens and blues and epics that drop that aren't bind on pickup or bind to warband on pickup is if you haven't got any BOE gear, what you can do is you can still right click it to, in inverted commas, equip it, but just simply learn the appearance of that even if you can't actually equip that item yourself, as you can see in the screenshot here. So yeah, these new rules around transmog collections have made it so much better for collectors of transmog, so fill your boots, run some old raids and get a ton of gear uh, nice and easy these days. Now speaking of collections, one brilliant thing that came with Warbands is that a lot of the currencies and things that you've collected over the years are now transferable between your characters. Now when you're scrolling down your list of currencies, you'll see any with the little campfire icon mean they are transferable in between your Warband. So you can send these just through this simple UI to your other characters. Now not every single currency will transfer unfortunately. A big red flag one that stands out to me is Anima. You actually can't currently transfer anima between characters and I think it's probably something to do with the fact that you can have anima in each of the different covenants pools so you basically got four banks of anima per character which is a little bit weird so it's probably some sort of coding reason as to why you can't currently transfer anima but there are the crates you can get to do that instead. Some currencies that come to mind that you can absolutely trade between characters are for example the Dark Moon Fur price tickets. Now, you could take advantage of the dailies and the weeklies of the Dark Moon Fur to get quite a good selection collection sorry of tickets on lots of different characters and then send them all to one character to get some of the bigger rewards like the dark moon dirigible mount for example which is i believe a thousand prize tickets so rather than doing all that on one character you can make use of an alt army other ones that do transfer are for example the apexis crystals from warlords of draenor now it was the time walking event recently and i had some apexis crystals scattered around different characters what i could have done is use these transferable currencies to send the Apexis Crystals to one character and use those to buy some of the reputation marks from the WAD factions. And you could also pair that with the fact that Time Walking Badges are now transferable between uh, characters too. So you could do the event, uh, the weekly event when that's up, to get one dungeon completed, which gives you an item, hand the item in, you get 500 Time Walking Badges, and then you could send them to your main, for example, and keep your stock on your main. So you can very quickly add currencies up like this. So it's absolutely worth going through your characters, seeing what currencies do transfer, and then seeing what stock you've got on there. Because it might be that you've got a big scattering around of resources, and you can pull them all together and buy yourself some nice reputation rewards, for example. So definitely check that out. Now, for the last few weeks of Dragonflight, it is true that the raids are all going to be awakened at the same time. So you can now get current item level gear from any raid you want to. So if you want to go back in there and farm transmog and things, it now is the last sort of ditch attempt to do so you can also still collect the bullions from the raid so if you want to grab some easy trinkets and things to use when you're leveling up for example the manic grief torch is going to make deleting rares and stuff pretty easy as you level up through the war within journey um you can do that as well one thing to not forget about if you haven't got it is the slime cap mount now that is currently three bullions that is going to be going away when dragonflight ends so this is your last chance pretty much to get the slime cap mount from shadowlands uh, so don't forget about that if you do want that mount. So that's things you can do absolutely for right now. The last couple of things to be mindful of is planning your leveling for when the War Within launches. So you might want to do things like stocking up on items, for example, goblin gliders, which may come in useful. You may want to make use of flasks and things and food if you really want to get that little edge on your leveling and killing speed. 
You could buy some speed potions, or if you're an engineer, make use of the Nitro Boosts Tinker on your belt, if you want to you know, blast through some indoor areas pretty quickly as well. And there's also gun shoes you could buy that also have that same effect, a bit of a speed boost. And for any healers, you may want to consider getting a sort of DPS heavy build there as well, just to make you a bit more efficient if you do end up finding yourself solo questing, for example. And the other final thing to consider is to get your bags all nice and clear. So you've probably got some Dragonflight junk in there that you really don't need. Don't be that person clinging onto that one potentially useful item that you're never going to use, that you think you just might use in that perfect scenario in six years' time. It's not going to happen. Either get it sold if you can, or just get rid of it and make some space for the new War Within junk that you're inevitably going to get within the next few weeks. And again, just a reminder, make use of the Warband Bank. It's probably a good idea to go in there and... Click the deposit all warband bound items, including your reagents or reagents, however you want to say the word, and then just get all your bags nice and clear with that. Buy as many tabs as you want or need as well. Uh, everything does share between your whole account. It isn't just the four characters in your warband bit at the top of the screen when you log in. It's every character on your account that can make use of that warband bank. So fill it up, get all your junk out of your bags. You don't want to be stuck there, you know mounting up on your Traveller's Tundra Mammoth or whichever and selling junk uh, while you're mid-questing. Just get it done before you go so you're nice and clear before the expansion launches. And the final thing I will add to this video is with the Radiant Echoes event, of which I did do a bit of a pre-patch guide for, uh, which I'll link in the description below, one of the rewards you can get from the Radiant Echoes event are the mounts. So there's the, the Griffin and the Wind Rider with the, you know, the sort of see-through spectral yellow and blue uh, colouring. Now, apparently you only have to buy one of these and it will unlock the alternative mount as well. So just so you know, you don't need to do this on a Horde and an Alliance character and grind up the, uh, I've forgotten what the currency is called now. That's ironic, isn't it? Um, the memories, the fractured memories. Let's just call them fractured memories. I'll put an image on the screen so you know exactly what I'm talking about. And before this video descends into chaos, I'm going to end it here. But yeah, you only need to buy one of those mounts and it will unlock the alternative one for the faction that you didn't currently buy it on if that makes any sense whatsoever. I hope it does. If not, shout at me in the comments and I'll see you there. That is that for this video, guys. Thank you very much for watching. I've been LazyBeast and I will indeed catch you next time. If you did enjoy this video, please do leave it a like and consider subscribing to the channel for more guides and content around World of Warcraft from me. I've been LazyBeast. Have a great day and I'll catch you next time. Cheers.